welcome to the second lecture of uh, this course aqueous corrosion and its control. Uh, before we proceed today's uh, topic, I would like to recollect what we discussed in the last class. We define what the corrosion is. Corrosion essentially means uh, the interaction of the material with the chemical environment leading to loss of materials, loss of function and that is the way it should be defined. We also look at what are the implications of corrosion of uh, engineering components. We saw that there is a huge loss for the nation in terms of uh, 3.5 to 4 GDP for any industrialized nation. And more importantly, the consequences of corrosion are very severe. It can affect the safety of the people, the environmental uh, degradation can happen because of corrosion, the consequence uh, of the pollution of the product with the environment. It can also affect the reliability of the components. It can also affect the product quality. If you are, for example, manufacturing a pharmaceutical drugs, it is very important that these drugs are pure. Or you transport water for drinking, the water has to be pure. It can affect the, the products. It can also affect the appearance of some of these, uh, you know, uh, components, or maybe like uh, you see the automobiles and so on. So, this requires a, a concerted effort in order to control corrosion to a large extent. We have seen in the last class also that thermodynamically the metals and alloys we deal with are unstable when they come in contact with the environment. Now, the question comes to us is can we predict whether a metal can undergo corrosion or not? Can we predict if a metal can undergo corrosion? If an alloy or a metal will suffer <coughs> Can we predict without doing an experiment? Can you predict? If we can so predict, then can we really determine the rate of corrosion? These are the two fundamental questions that we need to know, we need to address before we address the actual corrosion problems. Now, let us take the, the first one. Can we predict if an alloy or metal can suffer corrosion in a given environment? Before we address this question, uh, we need to go a little deeper into what a corrosion means. So, take an illustration. If I take a beaker and I fill this with let us say hydrochloric acid and I immerse let us say uh, steel, I immerse steel into this right, immerse steel. The major constituent of the seal is what? It is iron, right. So, what do you think will happen here? What do you observe? Will there be corrosion in hydrochloric acid? Yes. So, what do you visually observe? 
you will observe with your eyes the evolution of hydrogen right. There is a gas you may not know exactly it is hydrogen or not. You will see that the gas is being evolved on the metallic surface. We have seen in the last class that the corrosion is oxidation of metal at the same time that has to be a reduction reaction right. The electrons so liberated during oxidation process need to be accepted by some species. So, there is an oxidation process with reduction process. So, let us write this corrosion process in a chemical equation ok. How do you write this? Hydrochloric acid you put let us say steel I simplify it as iron and when they react with this what it forms? It forms ferric chloride plus hydrogen gas. So, this is a corrosion process. The metal is getting oxidized and the hydrogen ions in the hydrochloric acid turns into hydrogen gas by reduction process. Now, like that we can have several type of corrosion process. The ion can be immersed in sulfuric acid, the phosphoric acid. Can we really predict if the corrosion can occur with any chemical species? What is the first approach for you? It is a thermodynamic right. You look at the thermodynamics. What is the parameters you normally look at in a few? The free energy change. The free energy change for the reaction has to be negative. Then that reaction becomes spontaneous. Please notice this is a spontaneous process. The corrosion all along we refer to a spontaneous process. You do not supply external energy for the corrosion to occur. It is an external I mean it, it is an external agent, but a spontaneous process. So, look at the change in the free energy for a reaction that will tell you if the reaction will be spontaneous or not. We can give some examples. The obvious example is magnesium in water. Magnesium hydroxide ok. And the free energy change for this reaction is the delta G for this is is minus 142.6 kilocals. So, now we can say that magnesium for sure will corrode if it is exposed to water. I have introduced one more species here which is oxygen right. Water has a dissolved oxygen present. So, they react and form magnesium hydroxide. It is a corrosion process. The free energy change for that is negative. So, confidently you can say the reaction occurred. We also know of metals which are not undergoing corrosion when you immerse in water. The obvious example is what? It is a gold right. Gold does not undergo corrosion right. So, you can write the equation for that gold immersed in water it consists of oxygen there it forms gold hydroxide right. And you can balance the equation here the free energy change if you calculate if the re this reaction has occur is plus 157 kilocals. What does it mean? If this reaction has to occur, you need to supply this energy. Over here, 
you derive energy, energy comes out of the system. So, this reaction is non spontaneous and so, you can conclude that it is possible to predict based on the free energy concept whether the reaction will occur or not. But think of a corrosion process like you have a steel tank holding sulfuric acid, you want to know corrosion occurs or not or think of a case where the pipeline is buried in the soil. Now, there are two types of corrosion, corrosion occurs because of the soil interaction, the corrosion occurs because some product goes through the pipeline, it could be a petrochemical product, it could be a water. How do you really predict? Can we really go and determine the free energy change for all these corrosion processes? It is not very easy, ok. So, although the fundamentally the free energy change is easy to use, easy to understand, in practice it is not very easy to determine this actually. So, this cannot be used with comforts in predicting whether the metal will undergo corrosion or not. So, we need to go for a different criteria and that criteria is going to be what is called as electrochemical criteria. Now, we need to understand before we get into defining the criteria, we need to understand what is an electrochemical reaction ok. So, that is important to understand. Let us go back to this, e this equation here ok. Look at this equation, iron I write again iron reacts with hydrochloric acid and forms ferrous chloride plus the hydrogen. Do not worry too much about the chemistry, I think uh, we will try to minimize as much as we can ok. But if you have any doubt any time you are free to you know ask questions, so I will clarify that ok. But some amount of chemistry is very important in order to understand the corrosion process. Let us take this reaction. Now, look at closely you have iron it is in the metallic state. The hydrochloric acid is in what form? You have an ionic form H plus C L minus and you have ferric chloride is in the ionic form Fe 2 plus 2 C L minus and it is in the molecular form. With this you can understand very clearly how the charges are getting a transfer ok. So, what is common here and I think I need to change this, please change this reaction here ok. I think there is a mistake over here also, I think we need to change that ok ok. Please change that, so it is not properly balanced, so it should be 2 here right. Now, what happens? You can strike this, you can strike this. What remains? Iron interacts with 2 H plus and giving rise to what? And giving rise to Fe 2 plus plus hydrogen. So, this is the actual corrosion process occurring on the metal. We call this electrochemical reaction because the charges are transferred. Let me write it again to make it clear. What happens? Iron goes into solution as Fe 2 plus and you have 2 electrons and then these electrons interact with 
hydrogen ions and form hydrogen molecules. Now, it is clear the corrosion process consists of what? Consists of in oxidation ok and it consists of a reduction process. We saw this pictorially in the last class that iron gets oxidized as Fe2 plus releases two electrons this these two electrons are accepted by H plus and this so release releases hydrogen. So, you have one oxidation and at least one reduction process. I can make it more complicated. How do I make it more complicated? Assume that the hydrochloric acid has dissolved oxygen right can oxygen dissolve in water it can similarly the oxygen can dissolve in this. So, you can have one more reaction what is the reaction it could be oxygen plus 4 electrons it leaves 4 H plus and it leads to water. So, you can have one more reduction reaction. So, the same electrons provided by ion can go to H plus can go to oxygen here H plus and you can form water. So, you can have many reduction reactions. You can add if you want for example, I have a copper ion in the solution copper 2 plus you can combine with two electrons it can form. So, there can be another reduction reaction. So, you can make it more and more complex ok. In fact, in practice the corrosion processes are always complex it is not that simple ok. Many reaction can really occur. It looks very difficult now can we really predict the metal corrode or not that is a task. So, that we will see that how we can simplify this and we can write a simple equation to show that yes it is possible this reaction can occur. For example, I have put C 2 plus plus 2 electron gives you copper as reduction can I write like can I write say zinc 2 plus plus 2 electrons giving as zinc and the ion corrodes can I write like that? Is it possible? You can ask question. It may not be possible. So, that is what we are going to look at in the subsequent lecture ok. So, how do we really predict whether these reactions occur or not ok. So, far any of you have any questions ok. So, it is clear now. So, let us go to the next step of of our uh, uh, you know our understanding towards how do we predict if corrosion occurs. You are aware of what is called as equilibrium. You are aware of this right. What I mean here is a thermodynamic equilibrium where the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of backward reaction. Now, if you deviate from the equilibrium what happens? Either the forward reaction is faster than the backward reaction or the backward reaction will be faster than the forward reaction. So, let us use that concept. Let us first of all define what an equilibrium is, what an electrochemical equilibrium is. Why you are defining electrochemical equilibrium? Because we consider the corrosion is an electrochemical process. 
So, first let us define what is an electrochemical equilibrium. Let me go to the ion dissolution in sulfuric acid. Let us look at the equilibrium of ion in the solution. If I take a beaker, and I take in this a solution consisting of Fe2 plus ions right and then I immerse a pure ion in this. Nothing else Fe2 plus ions are in the solution ion is uh, immersed in the solution. So, what is expected to happen? What is expected to happen is that ion will go into solution as Fe2 plus. What will happen now? The Fe2 plus will again go back as ion that is in equilibrium. Okay. If the rate of this forward reaction and the backward reaction are equal, then we say it is under equilibrium condition. Now, I, I write this equilibrium here Fe2 plus plus 2 electron gives Fe. Please notice this is an equilibrium sign Fe2 plus is in equilibrium with Fe. There is a rate of reaction forward, the rate of reaction backward, and both are equal. when this happens at this interface the interface between what the interface between the ion and the solution you establish a potential right. So, I, I define it as I have a metal surface here and I have Fe2 plus ions they go and go back and between these two interface ok in these two solutions ok a potential is, is being established and that potential is called as equilibrium potential. That is called as an equilibrium potential. I can have two ways of looking at it. I can look at it from thermodynamic point of view, what is the free energy change for this equilibrium to exist delta G and at the same time I can also define this process in terms of equilibrium potential. I define as E ok and there exists a relation between two what are the two? The free energy change and the, the equilibrium potential between these two right. There exists a relation between these two. What is this relation famous relation? Most of you would have studied long ago right. Ten thousand huh? we call famous Nernst equation right. The Nernst equation is known for us and one second. So, we know the Nernst equation. What is Nernst equation? Delta G is equal to minus N F E. And delta G is free energy change. the reaction n is what the number of electrons involved involved in what involved in oxidation and reduction process and f Faraday constant.
and it is uh, what is the value any of you? 1.500 coulombs and E is the please notice I write this as equilibrium potential. this mass equilibrium potential. The potential that defines the equilibrium state. We are not talking about corrosion. What is corrosion? It is a spontaneous reaction of oxidation and corrosion I mean oxidation reduction process over here. No, we are talking about they are just in the equilibrium. Does iron corrode here? Does it corrode? It does not corrode at all. You wait for one day or one year the rate of uh, oxidation of iron is equal to the rate of reduction of iron and they happen. So, we are now only defining the equilibrium state ok. So, you have delta G equal to uh, minus uh, NFE. Now, I have a reaction I have an equilibrium for example, I have uh, something like F e 2 plus plus 2 electron gives you F e. If I need to know the free energy change for that and related to the potentials, I have delta G is equal to delta G naught plus R t L n k right. be people are aware of this equation. What is delta G naught here? Okay, and this standard state. Okay. So, is it is the standard state, okay? The standard state delta G is equal to the free energy change. So, the free energy change can be related to the delta G naught plus R T L and K. What is K here? K is equal to the equilibrium constant. It is uh, called the equilibrium constant. What is the equilibrium constant? Can somebody Can you can you tell from here? How do you expand this? How do I expand this for this equation above equation? Delta G is equal to delta G naught plus R T L n. What happens? The activity of iron upon activity of Fe 2 plus plus activity of electron here right. Talk about right. Now, let us substitute this one delta G is equal to minus N F E we have minus N F E is equal to minus n f e naught plus r t upon l n the activity of iron upon the activity of plus and activity of electrons here. And I can rearrange this so to e naught minus r t by N F L N activity of plus sorry. Yeah. Plus and uh, an 
activity of okay you can generalize this one right how do i generalize this i can generalize this as e is equal to e naught minus rt upon nf ln activity of the products upon the activity of the I can apply the standard state here. What is the standard state? Where the activity of the product is equal to activity of the reactants and their unity, right? So, under, under standard state, standard conditions, I would put that way. What are the standard conditions actually? Can you see? standard state is slightly different from standard conditions ok. The standard state is purely thermodynamic concept. The standard condition means you also talked about temperatures right. In a standard state it can be any temperature. In the standard conditions we define the temperature as what? Temperature is 25 degree Celsius ok. In any case uh, the activity of product is equal to reactance it becomes unity what happens? E is equal to E naught and what is E naught? It's equal to standard potential. E naught is uh, called standard potential. Are you followed? So, whether it is E naught or E both represent the equilibrium conditions. I again emphasize it is equilibrium conditions. We are not going to corrosion yet. I define the equilibrium condition and allow the equilibrium condition to deviate, then what happens? The corrosion occurs. My first task is to define the equilibrium condition wherein these species involved in corrosion are well defined. Are defined. What are the uh, species uh, which we are considering in the case of iron in, uh, in hydrochloric acid? The equilibrium condition of iron in iron 2 plus H with H plus. We are looking at two equilibrium conditions. So, my task is to first understand how do I define? What parameter do I use? to define this equilibrium and then use that to predict if the corrosion will occur or not ok. So, that is the way we are moving now. So, we have now gone into the electrochemical criteria of defining equilibrium from a thermodynamic criteria. For equilibrium to exist in a thermodynamic criteria delta G is, is equal to is 0 right. In this case, the equilibrium a condition for that is, is E naught, I mean E here. So, we can able to translate the free energy change into a potential here. That potential we call as electrochemical potentials or called as the equilibrium potential now ok. So, this is, is the first task for us. Any of you have any questions on here ok. I will ask this question to you. Suppose, I would like to know let us look at and imagine a, a thought process, thought experiment right. I want to know the equilibrium potential of zinc in zinc ions okay. I want to measure it maybe in the lab actually. So, what do you mean by zinc is equilibrium with zinc ions? What do you mean by that? Physically what it means? What do you mean by equilibrium right? When I say zinc or in equilibrium with zinc ions, how do you visualize this? Yeah. So, I have a I have a solution where I have zinc ions are present, I just simply dip zinc into it, it establishes an equilibrium and you measure that potential 
and that potential is called equilibrium potential. We call a standard potential when the concentration or the activity of big ions are considered as unity ok. So, this is what I mean. So, you can have you can extend this for almost all kinds of equilibrium systems. It could be for uh, hydrogen. Again, hydrogen, what do you do? You have H and H plus. How do I define uh, the equilibrium condition for hydrogen and uh, hydrogen ions? Let us say H plus is in equilibrium with uh, H. Here there is no metallic, uh, right. How do I establish? I would take a small beaker, I would take H plus ions. What is H plus ions here? Let us say sulfuric acid, ok. And I showed this with the hydrogen gas, I bubble this and I put a platinum electrode here, right. This is my a platinum electrode. I can I can also keep any noble metal, I can have uh, uh, you know um, maybe a rhodium I can have ok and I can have gold for example, I can put it. Now, how do you establish equilibrium? Over here the metal surface the hydrogen will get oxidized as H plus the electrons are released right. This H plus will again get reduced here and goes as hydrogen gas. So, you need a metallic connector in order that the exchange is taking place. So, how do I determine the equilibrium potential for various systems ok. That is our next task. How do you determine this? I would say I have taken copper, I am going to dip copper in copper sulfate solution of 0 0.1 molar concentration. I am going to immerse it let us say in 0 0.001 molar concentration of copper sulfate. Will the potential shown by the copper in both the solution the same or be different? Will be the same or different? Be different. What is the basis? Because it is this Ness equation. So, use the Ness equation to determine the equilibrium potential for any electrochemical system. So, that is the first step that you should understand, right. So, the first step is to calculate the equilibrium potential. Let us take let us say iron in say free chloride solution ok. That is they say calculation of equilibrium potential. I am in particular solution how to do that. We use the Nernst equation ok. E equal to E naught plus you can write R t by N f. I slightly change it here L n activity of the reactants on activity of the products. I can change also right I can just change this. There is always a confusion about the calculation of the potentials because we try to convert the thermodynamic parameter into electrochemical parameters. Let us go here A plus B uh, so this gives you C plus D or C plus D 
gives you a plus b okay? a, uh, a plus b ok. The Frenzy change for that is is let us say let us say plus the Frenzy change for that is considered as negative here right it is what generally you do here and we have some issues when it comes to electrochemical potential. So, I need to clarify this so that you do not make any mistake in determining the electrochemical potentials. Let us take this value here E naught. What is E naught? Standard potentials ok. The standard potentials are listed are listed ok. There used to be two conventions earlier one is called as American convention other was called as European convention. In American convention, they used to define the potential based on an oxidation reaction. Here, they used to be based on a reduction reaction. For example, I have a metal M. I represent this as m plus plus m electron and the European convention they look at it differently m plus plus electron gives you as m right. If you use a Nernst equation for this, the Nernst equation for this literally use literally use it ok you will get one sign here, you get another sign here. Numerically the value is going to be the same and not going to change, but the sign is going to be different. For example, if you get here positive, if you get it at here it becomes negative automatically ok, it becomes negative, negative in this convention. So, that is a problem in actually defining what the equilibrium potential is. You take the old books and you to take the old Fontana book, you would write as standard oxidation potentials or some other people write as standard reduction potentials. That clarity is very important without which you are likely to make mistake in really predicting if the metal will corrode or not ok. Now, let us let us me try to explain this why we should not look at either American convention or European convention both are wrong this is not correct ok. What do you say so? Let us take an equilibrium. any equilibrium you can take you want let us say copper. I immerse copper in copper 2 plus ions solution right. What is happening here? That be equilibrium right. What is the equilibrium here? The equilibrium is that copper goes as copper 2 plus and copper 2 plus it will return back and gets deposited. The oxidation reaction, reduction reaction both of them occurring on the same surface. Unless the rate of oxidation equal to rate of reduction you do not call it as a equilibrium process ok. So, we are now talking about equilibrium potential. Please look at this. 
the potential established between the metal and the solution is equal to what is that called? If I measure a potential that exists between the metal and the solution, what is that potential called? That is called as a equilibrium potential now. So, the potential so measured is equal to equilibrium potential. Now, let us take this to convention, right? Let us take an American convention. We call a standard oxidation potential, but also means it is equilibrium potential, right? We call a standard reduction potential. This is also called equilibrium potential. Either way you use, okay, okay, it is, it is written like this, written like this. In fact, the better way of writing here will be M is going to be M plus plus electron here, M plus plus electron is equal to M here. I have just reversed this, okay, equation. But please notice if I write this way or this way, that means I can write either as m going as m plus plus electron or I can write as m plus plus electron is m. In both the ways I, I represent the equilibrium, whatever way I represent, this is the picture, just look at this, is the picture is same or different, same. So, you cannot have a potential for this different from this because both are describing the same manner. Look at it now. So, it is not the equation written in a different manner, but actually equilibrium is the metal is in equilibrium with the ions. No matter how you write it, in the lab you do an experiment, it represent a transfer of copper ions to solution and so and the copper ions from the solution to the metal. So, it is not dependent upon this, does not depend upon this. So, it is independent. So, that means the sign invariant actually is called sign invariant. Okay. So, it is a sign invariant. So, the electrochemical potential is sign invariant. So, first and foremost you need to understand that electrochemical potential is sign invariant. It does not depend upon American convention, it does not depend upon European convention, you do not fall as standard oxidation potential you do not call as standard direction potentials, you simply call as standard potentials, which implies it is standard equilibrium potentials. The same is true for equilibrium potential, you do not call equilibrium oxidation potentials, you do not call equilibrium reduction potentials, ok. It is simply it is an equilibrium potential that is what is important. So, I have so far tried to explain to you what is mean by electrochemical equilibrium I suppose right. The electrochemical equilibrium exists at the solid solution interface. There is an exchange of ions or charges between the solution and the, the metal interface. And doing so, it establishes a potential, we call them as equilibrium potentials. If this activity of the ions in the solution is considered as unity, it becomes a standard potentials. I did not so far mention about this here. For a pure solid, the activity is always considered as a 1 actually ok. Suppose you take a copper alloy, it is not 1 actually ok. So, it is generally this is considered as unity here when you talk about pure metal, pure solids be it platinum, be it nickel, be it iron, the pure form the activity is assumed to be to be equal to 1. So far any of you have any questions about what is mean by electrochemical equilibrium. Can I can I proceed further? Yeah? Yeah. How do we use Nance equation? Ok. So, now the question comes is ok, if I am going to use Nance equation, 
how am I going to use Nernst equation for example, that is what the question is right. So, how do I because the Nernst equation if I see here reactants and products depends upon how do you write it right. I can write uh, on the left side oxidized product right side is reduction product or I can write left side as reduced product right reduced uh, yeah reduced uh, as species as as, uh, as a reactants and you have oxidized one as a product right. So, you have this problem. So, that problem I think we should need to resolve otherwise you do not know how to calculate actually right. But the point you need to be clear about is it is not oxidation it is not reduction it is simply equilibrium. So, that is what I think you should be first be aware of it actually ok. How to do that? I will come to the next step as to how you really calculate these these uh, these values ok. So, calculation of of equilibrium potential. First, the basis. The basis is ok it establishes a, a potential here right. So, there is a potential existing between the metal and the solution I need to measure this ok. I need to measure this. So, how do I measure this potential? How do I measure this potential ok? Measuring potential you know Suppose, I have a resistor, how do we measure the potential between these two point? Hmm? I connect to voltmeter and I make a contact here, I contact here, I measure this. To measure the potential across a distance to different locations, I need one more reference actually. So, potential is always measured with respect to the other one right. If I have to measure the potential here, I need to insert another probe right. I use a probe, I can use a voltmeter, I can use uh, or more precisely we call as electrometer right. What is the difference between a simply saying voltmeter and, and electrometer. Electrometer does not allow the current to pass through you know when you measure the voltage or you can use in a high impedance voltmeter right. When you use high impedance voltmeter what happens? Does not allow the current to pass through. You will understand this concept when you talk about polarization uh, later stage. At this at this point of time it is enough to understand that you need to measure the potential using an electrometer or an high impedance voltmeter. Okay, suppose I I put a probe here, I measure it. What do you think will happen? When I put here, I am going to get another interface here, right? I am going to have an equilibrium between this one and the solution. So there is going to be a potential develop automatically right. So, you are going to develop another potential here right. There is going to be another potential developed by the probe. So, you will essentially measure only the potential difference. You will never able to measure the absolute value of this potential because no matter what you do you need to have one more probe to measure 
and that establishes a potential that is the problem that means is ok. Absolute potentials cannot be measured. You can measure only the relative potentials. So, what do you do in this case? They use the equilibrium H plus plus electron giving rise to hydrogen in the standard state okay. so, E naught is considered as 0. So, you are assuming the equilibrium of H plus and hydrogen is equal to 0 right. So, when I use an hydrogen electrode here, I measure the potential and that potential is called as a simply the electrode potentials. So, so that means ok. So, all the potentials Or in essence, preferred with respect to hydrogen H plus electrode. Okay. So, this is the, the most important thing you should keep in mind. I again repeat you cannot really measure absolute potential electrochemical potential of any system. It is referred in reference to hydrogen because it is assumed to be 0 in the standard state ok. Now, let us come back to this the measurement of high uh, potential here. How do you do that? I use that. Say some metal M is in equilibrium with the M plus, ok. Metal M is in equilibrium with metal plus, and here what happens? I have a platinum wire H plus, and I bubble. Hydrogen gas. What is the pressure here? P equal to 1 atmosphere, ok. And I measure this voltage, ok, using an electrometer. When I measure this voltage with respect to electrometer, what it what it does? It does not allow the current to flow through this. Please notice if I have a potential 1 and a potential 2, I just electrically short what happens? Current will start flowing. That is not going to happen here. You, you do not allow the current to flow. That means, equilibrium is maintained equilibrium is maintained ok and here also the equilibrium is maintained. Is maintained. What is the equilibrium here? It is nothing but m plus plus electron gives you m 
What is the equilibrium here? H plus plus electron gives you hydrogen. Okay. The equilibrium is maintained. Now I am going to measure the voltage, and that voltage is equal as the equilibrium voltage or equilibrium potential. You agree? Can I call this as, as an equilibrium potential? As long as the current does not flow, as long as the equilibrium is maintained here, the equilibrium is maintained over here and the voltmeter is just measuring the potential of this equilibrium with respect to this equilibrium. I have made this equilibrium as a value the potential of this is equal to 0 and so whatever value you measure here is called as the equilibrium potential. Did I make it clear to you? Did I make clear or anybody has any questions? How do we get the equilibrium potential of the metal? since there is no kind of flow to the voltmeter. Yeah, see uh, one of the ways um, uh, ideally you know uh, how do you measure the potential using a potentiometer. Anybody remember the potentiometer by null diffraction method. Anybody did fewer experiments right. I want to measure potential between the point 1 and point 2. I do a null diffraction method so that I keep on adjusting external resistance voltage and when the when the you know the current does not flow the potential measured between these two right is the actual potential right. So, I apply external voltage actually so that so that the current is not going to flow. So, what we do in this case is that it is external so potential meter is essentially is a balancing time right you balance it with the external equal amount of voltage I do that. So, what I do I I I ensure that the potential applied externally is almost equal to these two value. So, that the current does not flow between these two you know normally we use the galvanometer right and keep on pressing it and find out at one point of time the no deflection takes place. The potential measured is equal to the potential between these two points. So, when we when we say that I have potential 1 and potential 2 I use an electrometer that means the electrometer is supposed to be not allowing any current to flow through that. At that point of time you measure the potential between these two and that potential is equal to the the actual potential of the system. Otherwise, when the current flows you will see later there is something called polarization you will not able to measure the actual values. So, what I refer here is you need to measure potential when they are under equilibrium conditions. The current flows they are no more under equilibrium condition you are not going to measure the actual value ok. So, so, so that is what it is. So, we are measuring the potential under equilibrium condition and so it is called as an equilibrium potential. What I am trying to say this potential is not only calculated using the Nernst equation, this potential can also be measured in the lab. You can go to the lab, you can measure it. I think we will do some experiment uh, in, the, in the lab to measure the potential of copper copper sulphate solution and see that the measured value is almost equal to what you calculate. So, it is possible to calculate and also possible to measure. The question is what you calculated and what you measured has to be same ok. So, that is the point we are going to come to this. Am I am I clear in this actually ok. So, how do I calculate the potential now? now the calculated potential 
and the measure must be the same. Okay, it cannot be different in these two. So, it becomes same if you write the equilibrium equilibrium to be written the equilibrium to be written as follows. Always write oxidized species on the left hand side and reduced species on the right side. This is the first thing you should start with. You may have equilibrium. What are the species under equilibrium here? This is oxidized species, reduced species. Ok. Suppose an example you want, I will say. Fe2 plus two electron gives you Fe. This is the reduced species, this is oxidized species, right like that, ok. Then you write the Ness equation, right. Ness equation is equal to E0 plus 0 point naught, naught sorry, E equal to E0 plus R T by N F L N activity of the oxidant upon the activity of electrons. Please write always like this, ok. Then you will not have any problem whatsoever in actually calculating the value which is equal to which will be equal to the measure value. So, no matter what you know reaction we, we deal with the equilibrium should be already written as oxidant on the as a reactant and reductant as the product you should do that ok. You should do this. So, when you do this and you will not have any problem in terms of the obtaining these values of this. Okay. Please notice the E is a function of what the standard potential, the activity of the oxidant, the activity of the reductant actually. Of course, these are not going to be changing right for a given reaction N is constant, T is a given temperatures. R is a gas constant, the F is a Faraday there, right. So, they are not going to change. So, the E can be changed by changing this the activity, by changing the activity of the reactants. For all practical purposes in our course, we will consider the concentration equals to the activity. So, we consider consider ok concentration is equal to activity for calculation. Okay. So, you do not have to worry about what the activity is. Actually, what is the relation between activity and concentration? Any of you? No? Yeah. So, concentration multiplied by activity coefficient is equal to activity, right? Ok. So, the, so but you do not worry, we normally consider the activity coefficient equal to unity, which is not true. Ok, but uh, you for all practical purposes you simplify that actually ok. So, we considered uh, the concentration equal to activity and use this equation to, to measure this. Please notice E, let us look at E here. 
when will the e go up When will the E go, go up? When the activity of oxidants increases. When will the E will uh, re uh, reduce? When the activity of reluctance changes. So, you can change these values. Please understand that means E is a function of, I would use the term now concentration of the oxidant and the concentration of reluctance ok. So, we both of them can change these values. So, the first exercise for you is um, to learn to calculate the equilibrium potentials. Let me uh, go to the next step. I will explain and then leave it for you to 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 to, to think over uh, until we meet next next. Let us have this corrosion of of let us say iron in let us say sulfuric acid. I want to predict if the corrosion occurs or not in sulfuric acid. How do I predict? Let us go back to the corrosion reaction iron, it is immersed in uh, H2SO4. Sorry, excuse me. Iron immersed in uh, its base of 4 give rise to what? Iron sulfate plus hydrogen here. Now, you know in this case it is going to corrode. I just only want to give you uh, you know how you can prove that the iron will corrode in sulfuric acid. Before corrosion occurs, there will be two equilibria, right? What are the equilibria you will have? One equilibria will be H plus plus electron gives you hydrogen, the other equilibria will be Fe2 plus plus 2 electron gives you iron. These are the two equilibria that will be existing right. If iron has to corrode what would happen? So, what should happen is this equilibria now what happens should happen is iron should go as Fe2 plus plus 2 electrons and this should go as H plus you know about it ok. And you also know that this equilibrium has one potential, this potential is referred as H plus, H is one potential for this and this has got what E F E 2 plus and F E as other potentials. So, this equilibrium is not defined in terms of the two electrochemical potentials E you know E H plus H and E Fe 2 plus and F E. And when the reaction occurs like that, what will happen to this? It forms a cell, it forms an electrochemical cell. ok. 
it forms electrochemical cell right. The electrode 1, the electrode 2, you form a cell now ok. It forms a cell. So, I have E, E 1 and E 2 ok. And you have an E cell is always positive. No matter what happens right. If I have electrode 1, electrode 2, I connect them, you will get a positive potential right irrespective of irrespective of what the value of E 1 is and E 2 is as long as they are different, you join them together the E cell will always be positive. It can never be negative at all. Now, the question is can this, can this occur, can this occur. Now, let us give some value for this ok. And now, I assume that I assume now I am in equilibrium with, uh, with uh, Fe2 plus in equilibrium with iron in the standard condition which is equal to E naught is, is minus 0 0.44 volts suppose I assume this. And I also have an equilibrium potential for hydrogen and E naught for this is equal to 0 0 volt. Let us look at this, look at this. And the E cell will always be positive and the E cell is equal to what is how do you define E cell in a few remember is equal to E cathode minus E anode. E cell equals to E cathode minus E anode. If the corrosion to occur, if the corrosion to occur, this reaction has to be either cathode or anode, cathode, this has to be anode. For the sake of argument, for the argument sake, you assume that this is the cathode and this is the anode, right. For sake of argument, assume this is the anode and this is the cathode. What does it mean that iron will not corrode in the, the sulfuric acid? Am I right or not? I assume that iron will not corrode in sulfuric acid. What is wrong in my sense? I assume because I do not know. If I know, I do not have to predict, right? I do not know. So, I assume that iron is not going to corrode in sulfuric acid. Then you make a calculation see what happens to E cell ok. We do not talk about delta G now here. You look at the E cell now what happens right. What is E cell now? E cell in this case is equal to minus 0 0.44 minus of 0 0 is equal to minus 0 0.44 volt. So, I assumed okay, what is the assumption here? The assumption that iron does not corrode. Assumption that iron does not corrode leads to E cell which is minus 0.44 which means I assumed it wrongly. Then I correct myself and I will say yes, 
ion is anode, it's a cathode, I get the answers. What is the advantage of this? The advantage of that is that I do not have any assumption. I do not assume an oxidation potential. I do not assume to be a reduction potentials. I do not assume anything. I am free to assume wrongly and try to calculate. I can get corrected. Okay. So, you will never go wrong if you are going to understand what is equilibrium, what is equilibrium potentials, what is the cell voltage and accordingly apply these concepts, you can clearly predict that a metal can corrode or metal will not corrode ok. So, no assumption whatsoever is involved in whole of these processes. So, that is why it is important that we be systematic ok in our own understanding of the electrochemical concept. I think we have come uh, you know close to the end of the uh, session. I think we will uh, continue this tomorrow, it is very important. What I want you to read understand during the intervening period is please go through all these notes first of all. Understand what is electrochemical equilibrium. How do I define this electrochemical equilibrium using the Nernst equation? How do I calculate the equilibrium potential using the Nernst equation? What is the relation between uh, the uh, the E cell and the corrosion? So, we did not cover much, but these are the basic things that will come to you again and again when you talk about oh will the metal corrode or not. If I know that zinc is corroding why should I calculate it right? People assume let us assume oxidation and so corrosion takes place is not going to happen. So, no assumption should be involved and you should go purely based on the, the fundamental understanding of the electrochemical processes. I do hope that uh, uh, when you come next time you have uh, read ones we will uh, have more discussion on this ok and uh, thanks. <laughs>